All right, hey guys. Um, I'm going to give you a really brief lecture on Persia, and uh, this will be helpful for our quiz that we're going to have next time we meet. Uh, so if you do the reading and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, watch the video, you should be good for Persia. All right. Now, uh, one of the things about <clears throat> the quiz that we're not going to have, excuse me, there's not going to talk about Zoroastrianism on the quiz. In fact, that's something I want to go over with you after we take the quiz. So. When studying for the quiz, read uh, through the chapter up till we talk about the religion of Persia, which is Zoroastrianism, and uh, that's not going to be the quiz. We'll talk about that together after the quiz, okay? Now, um, Persia. What you have to imagine is the Middle East, okay? And if, you, if you're looking at a map, you've got uh, the countries of like Israel and Jordan and Syria and all those places that are on the news today, and you, you move a little further to the east, and that area is what we know as Persia. Um, and in that part of the world, those people are Persians uh, living in the countries of Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Now, they are not Arabs, okay? Arabs, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, the Middle East, those are Arabs. Persians are Persians, Arabs are Arabs. They don't like being called Arabs, and Persians don't like being called, you know, what I mean. Anyway, so we're talking about the countries of Iraq, and Iraq, of course, was Mesopotamia. So we're Iraq, we're also to the east of that, Iran and then to the east of that, Afghanistan. So that block of, of the world is Persia between India and the Middle East. Okay, so last time we talked about this period, this area of the world, the Assyrians were in control, right? The Assyrians had conquered a lot of people, including the Jews. They had moved everyone out. They had a great military as we studied. But one thing about the Assyrians is the way they kept control of the conquered people was to subjugate them in a very brutal way. The Jews are a perfect example. The Jews were, uh, were, were massacred and killed. The survivors were enslaved and sent off to Babylon. Uh, and that was just one example of many atrocities committed by the Assyrians. And what you have is you have a very powerful group of conquerors, but they are very cruel. And, and they rule through fear. The, the fear is that if you rebel against us, we're going to kill you in very nasty ways. Um, and what that leads to is anger and hate. And that's eventually what's going to do in the Assyrians. And, and this is a conversation that we have when we talk about the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire is what's the best way to govern an empire? Uh, is it through fear where people are so intimidated by you that they won't rebel? Or is it through more cooperation and kindness? Uh, and this is the examples that we're talking about today. So anyway, back to the Assyrians. Eventually, they would be overthrown by a united front who just wanted to get rid of them because they were nasty. And one of those strong allies in that front were the Persians. Okay, The Persians were a nomadic people that came from that area of northern Persia, which would be Iran. They moved down into the area known as Persia proper uh, toward the Middle East. And uh, they, they allied with another group called the Chaldeans in order to conquer and overthrow the Assyrians. And that's what really set them on their rise to power. Now, the king that began the great Persian Empire, as we read in the textbook, his name is Cyrus. In 550 BCE, Cyrus comes to power. Now, I know I'm doing this at night in my classroom, so uh, we don't usually have a glare like this from the lamp. Hopefully, you can see it. It's funny, when I get really close to it, it just gets white. But when I get further back from it, it, it you can see it. So, I don't know if you're seeing the same thing I am. If you're having trouble, look at the notes to email me and we'll, we'll fix it, okay? But 550 BCE, Cyrus becomes king of Persia, and that's when Persia really begins to take off. He expands his empire from modern-day Iran to Mesopotamia. He conquers Babylon, and he extends his empire to the Middle East. And so he is an expander, a conqueror, and he's not content with just having a very strong Persian kingdom in Persia. He's going to push it out and expand the boundaries. Okay. Now, one of the things about the Persians, and we talk about warfare and how warfare changes and whoever has the new technology, whoever has the new strategy, is going to be the conquerors. The uh, Syrians had chariots, right? Um, then bronze weapons come along. Then iron weapons come along. And, and every advance, uh, the society using that advancement are going to have the upper hand in warfare. Well, the Persians have an advancement, right? And I'll give you a hint. They are the first soldiers in history to wear pants. And those pants are made of leather. So think about it, all right? I'll give you a few seconds. Why is it significant that the Persians wore leather pants? Do, 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 do. Was it because they were the rock stars of the ancient world? No, it's not. They were horse riders. They had bred a particular type of horse 
feeding a certain type of brain that allowed it to be large enough to actually sit on the back of the horse and not pull a chariot. And so you can't ride a horse in a toga. you got to have leather pants. So they wore leather pants. They were horse riders, and they were great archers as well. So we have the one of the first examples of horse riding archers, and we're going to find a lot of those uh, in, in the ancient world before the year is over. Okay, so yes, horse riders, so they're very, very fast. They're much faster than chariots, much more maneuverable than chariots being just on a horse. And, uh, and yeah, it solidifies the horse is really the most important animal in, in history, right? Let's see if I can scroll down here. Oh, okay, got it already on my board. You know, you know the drill. Let me do this real fast. Hold tight. You know what happens with this board. Drive me crazy. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, let's see if it's going to work out. It might not. Okay, what I'm probably going to do, just give me a second. Let me get my mouse. Oh. There we go. Okay, so the empire would spread from India in the east to Greece in the west. So just under Cyrus, and it will expand even more than this after his death, just under King Cyrus the Great, the empire has expanded 2,000 miles east to west, which is the biggest. And again, when we talk about Mesopotamia, what we're talking about is the old adage, there's always a bigger fish in the sea, right? You have the little fish eaten by the big fish that's eaten by another fish that's eaten by another fish. That is the pattern of empire in Mesopotamia. The Sargon, a massive, powerful empire, well... Not so fast. Hammurabi's Babylonian Empire is bigger. Oh, not so fast. The, the, uh, the Syrians are bigger. And now the Persians are the biggest so far, right? And they are going to include even more of uh, the Middle East and Persia, right? Okay, so let's go to the next page. I'll use my mouse here to get us there. There we are. Okay, so the style of government. Now, this is what's interesting, especially when you talk about the Assyrians and how nasty they were. If you want to make a comparison, this is your comparison, right? The idea of Persia is to be tolerant. We're going to conquer you, but then we're actually going to leave you alone. Example, the Jews, right? The Persians conquer Assyria, and they see all these Jewish slaves lying around. And, and Cyrus gets the idea, oh, I'm going to let you go home. And he doesn't just say, go home. He says, my God has spoken to me, your God has spoken to me, and said for you to go home. So Cyrus essentially has become a prophet, right? And he uses that propaganda of Jewish belief to send them back to Jerusalem, to tell them to rebuild their temple. The Jews love Cyrus. He's in the Bible, right? They mention him in the Bible as a hero. He even goes to Jerusalem after they rebuilt the temple and worships with them like a Jew. What king does that in the ancient world? If Cyrus were alive today, he could run for office and be elected because that's the type of leader he was. Now, why? Why doesn't he just use cruelty like everybody else before? Well, it's more efficient. He doesn't have to pay for a standing army to constantly keep down rebellions. If I conquer you, but I make your life better than it was before, then maybe I'm not such a bad guy after all, and you can forgive me and live your life, and I could be your king, right? And that's kind of the Persian philosophy of, of empire. We're going to rule over you. We're going to give you freedom. We're going to build you roads. We're going to lower your taxes. We're going to build walls around your cities. It's going to be a better quality of life for you. Just let us rule over you, right? And that was a very successful way for the Persians to rule. And we look at empires throughout history, those are the empires that have been successful. Those that have made peace with the people they've conquered and allowed them to live in peace. And that's the key. I think we've said before in here, the story of civilization is two things. First of all, we want freedom, but then we also want safety. Under the Persians, people were safe. And they were fine with that as long as they could have, you know, uh, their their, you know, business and, 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 you know, have their lives the way it was before and be safe. And so they, most people accepted Persian rule gladly, okay? So the leave it alone method is what the notes call it there. Once the kingdom was conquered, the Persians left the people alone to live their lives as before. The Persian army was forbidden from burning cities, stealing goods, killing civilians, no rape, burn, and pillage in the Persian army under penalty of death. So once the city was conquered, then it was left alone, right? Persians were paid by the government, not by pillaging. Okay, let's go down a little bit. Okay, so once in control, the Persian king appointed a governor, a satrap, okay, and I think the book mentioned that word too, so that's an important word to know. The governor of a Persian region was called a satrap, 
and he was over the region which was called a satrapy. Again, another word from the book. Okay, So satrap is the governor, satrapy is the region that he governs. And this, of course, we talked with China about the beginnings of feudalism. This is the idea of a noble, right? A satrap is a noble, a governor that rules over an area like you were a little king, but he answers to the great king. Okay? Um, so the Persians would improve cities. They conquered by building projects, irrigations, new roads. They lowered taxes. And this was good for the city, but it was also good for the empire as well because the roads allowed soldiers to move back and forth easily. Uh, the, and it just civilized the area and made it easier to rule. Right? So it was a win-win for people in the area to improve their lives. Okay? Persians also freed the people who had been slaves, the Jews that we just talked about. Right, So they let the Jews go home and let them rebuild their temple. This is all in the Old Testament. Right? So after the death of Cyrus, his son Cambyses comes to power. Now, Cyrus was a uh, unique figure in the ancient world, and uh, he did things in a unique way, as we just discussed. Cambyses did not understand that way so much, and Cambyses wanted to be the conqueror of tradition, which is, I'm going to conquer you, and I'm going to rule over you, and I'll do whatever the heck I want, because I am the conqueror, right? So uh, he adds Egypt to the empire, so they go south on the Nile, and they conquer Egypt, they add Egypt to Persia, but Cambyses was a cruel ruler, unlike his father, enslaved the Egyptians and, and, and persecuted them, right? And uh, this, of course, worried many people in the Persian government that this was the beginning of the end. We treat people like this and we'll go the way of the Assyrians. And so there's a special force in the military of the Persians, and that special force is called the 10,000 Immortals. They're at the bottom of the notes there. Okay, now if you are familiar with those movies, the 300 or Rise, whatever, right? The 10,000 Immortals are in those movies. Now, there's nothing really historically accurate about those movies, but the 10,000 Immortals were once. They didn't have snake faces like in the movie. They were just regular people. But the legend of this, and all special forces have legends attached to them and that make them larger than life. The legend is that there were always 10,000 of them. Even if you killed one, another would automatically take its place. So the legend is you can't ever kill them all. There will always be 10,000. And so they're an unbeatable force. Well, the leader of the 10,000 Immortals was a general named Darius. And the general sees what Cambyses is doing and doesn't like it. He's, he's very uncomfortable with, with this style of rule. It's not like, because he ruled, he, he served under Cyrus, and he knew what a great king, king Cyrus was. So Darius plans a coup. He rebels against Cambyses. He takes over and becomes King Darius the first of Persia. So not related to Cyrus, but his, his ruling style was much closer to Cyrus, right? So he brings back the policies of Cyrus after, after the rebellion. Now, here are the accomplishments of Darius. Darius expands the empire even more, but he's going to um, spend more time uh, modernizing the empire, and by modernizing by ancient world standards, right? He builds a massive road that goes all the way through the empire east to west. They call it the Royal Road. It's a major highway through the Persian Empire, connected all the major cities in the empire, and it allowed, of course, faster, faster access for merchants and, and soldiers, armies, moving back and forth along the roads. And the roads, of course, were protected by the military, right? So it's a safe place to live. Yeah, so uh, also, uh, the road was 1,677 miles, so that's pretty much the entire empire. All the major cities were included. Um, they also created a postal system, right? And the postal system um, had runners. Uh, riders that would ride, like guess, uh, if you're familiar with American history of the West, we talk about the Pony Express. This was kind of the Persian Pony Express, where they would take messages from one place to the other using the Royal Roads. Um, if you've ever heard the U.S. Postal Service motto, uh, through um, no rain, nor sleet, nor snow, nor dead of night will keep us from our appointed rounds, that is actually Persian. Uh, a Greek philosopher uh, was writing about the Persian postal system and mentioned that. And the, our U.S. postal system, someone read that and go, oh, that sounds cool. And so they, they applied it to our U.S. postal service. So we get that from the Persians. But uh, blew your mind. Okay, now, he also created coins. Um, and so, again, money is new in, in, in the world, right? We barter, we trade for this and that. What do coins bring us? How do coins uh, strengthen an economy? Well, it's standard, right? It shows that the king is powerful. Whose head do you think are on each coin? Darius, right? And it shows that all transactions in his empire are controlled by the government, and so they use coins in order to demonstrate that. And the coins are made of silver and gold and precious metals, right? But they were a symbol 
that Darius was the one in charge of the economy as well as everything else. So standardized coins were used and weights and measures. You know, you knew exactly how much gold you had because it was in a coin. You didn't have to bring in some gold nuggets and have it weighed on a scale. You just gave them the coin like we do today and it was set, right? So a standard of currency in the empire. He established his capital at the great city of Persepolis. Persepolis isn't a city anymore. It's a ruin. But it has, still has some beautiful buildings and palaces and stuff there. Very impressive uh, in, in its height. Uh, but, of course, he has all the other ancient cities in his empire as well. He has the cities of Egypt, like Memphis, the city Babylon and Mesopotamia, all part of the Persian Empire. But his capital is Persepolis. All right, moving on. Okay, so uh, if you lived under the Persians, here's what you had to do. You had to pay taxes, right? And so, uh, and in the ancient world, you were to pay a taxes to a local king or pay a taxes to the Persians. And that's what we talk about how your life really didn't change. You, you know, you pay taxes anyway, and so why not to the Persian king, especially if you made your life better? Um, the empire, as we said, were divided into regions as satrapies. Governor Satrap was over that region. Uh, now, the local officials collected taxes and sent them to the satrap who sent them to the emperor. So you have, of course, like the feudal system, you have a top-down uh, system that the people on the bottom who do most of the work pay their goods and services, sometimes in services, sometimes in coins, up to the satrap. The satrap will take his allotted share that the king says he must take, and then he'll send the rest of it up to the king, right? And that's how the system worked. What if, though, what if the satrap was greedy? What if he kept more than his share? What if he taxed the people more than the king told him to so he could make himself wealthy? Well, there were checks and balances for that. Oh, yeah, before we get to that, though, there's a military obligation required all groups living under the Persian Empire to provide troops for war. And so you've got a massive empire, and you have huge population in the empire, and one of the obligations is that when we go to war, you must provide an army, right? And so what this does is it makes the Persian military the largest military the world has ever seen in the West, we're going to leave China out of it. We talked about China is just a different ball game, right? But from India all the way over, the Persians now have the largest military that the world has ever seen, right? Uh, and it's made up of this multinational force from all over the empire. They just call them together, and there are troops from Africa and troops from the Middle East and troops from, from all the way to India, and they have their own weapons and their own styles, but they all serve the Persian king. And that's a strength, but it's also a weakness that we'll talk about. Okay, so, um, eventually there was a group of people who were not agreeable to Persian rule, right? Uh, most people that the Persians came in contact with would be happy to live under the Persians for a couple of different reasons. One, they wouldn't be killed by the Persians, and two, their lives would be okay, not too bad, right? They wouldn't be enslaved, they'd be treated fairly. Right? And it got to the point where the Persians believed that they could just like, go to anyone and say, look, I could either give you my hand of peace or give you my hand of war, and they would accept the hand of peace. Well, not the Greeks, right? Now, the Greeks, and as we'll talk about the Greeks, we're going to talk about these wars in a little more detail when we get to the Greeks. We're going to just kind of skim them and give you the Persian side of it, right? Um, the Greeks had established colonies, not just in Greece, but all over the Mediterranean Sea. Yes? And one of those cities that were Greek was in Turkey, and that was Ionia, right? Now, um, the Persians had conquered that area and also conquered the Greek city of Ionia, and they lived under the Persians. Now, Ionia would look across to their brothers in Greece and go, ooh, they're free, and we're not free. It would be nice to be free, right? So the Ionians planned, sillily planned, a rebellion against the mighty Persian Empire, and they knew they couldn't beat them by themselves. So they appealed to their Greek brothers in Greece, Please send us troops and money and help us fight the Persians. Now, none of the city-states in Greece sent anything but Athens. Athens felt sympathy for the Ionians, and Athens sent support, whatever that support was. The Ionians rebel against the Persians, and predictably they are crushed. Uh, and then the Persian king Darius gets the information that the Athenians helped out the Ionians. And so now he has an excuse to go a little further west and invade Greece. And there we have the Persian Wars. Okay? Now... And this is what the notes say. The Ionians rebel against the Persians. The Ionians ask the Greeks for help. The Athens agrees. The Persians crush the rebellion. And then they blame Athens for giving them aid. Okay? All right. So, Darius 
probably might have already been planning an invasion of Greece, but this gives him an excuse, right? Darius plans an invasion of Greece, um, and Greece is small, and each city-state has probably 30,000 citizens at most, right? 30 to 40,000. Um, per, uh, the Persians can fill, field an army of 40,000 like that, right? And that's just soldiers. With the city-states, we're talking about men, women, children, about 30 to 40,000. And so the Persians don't take the Greeks very seriously. They feel it would be pretty easy to conquer them. In fact, they want to use Athens as an example. And if they conquer and burn Athens to the ground, all the other city-states of Greece will say, oh, okay, we give up and they'll surrender, right? So Darius uh, sends a fleet of ships over with about 60,000 men uh, to Greece in order to attack Athens. Get it out of the way, have the other cities surrender, no problem, right? He's not taking them very seriously. So Athens learns of the threat and asks for help. But no help comes. And this is when we study the Greek city-states, we have to understand that they were fiercely independent, even of each other, right? And so uh, when Athens is in trouble and facing a massive Persian army, the other Greek city-states aren't, oh, we have to help our Greek brothers. The other Greek city-states are mostly, oh, you got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out. We're going to watch it, we're going to eat some popcorn, it's going to be fun, right? And so there's that. It takes a lot for the Greek cities to ally with each other and fight together, right? Because they're, they're kind of... Um, they, fight, they fight each other all the time, so there's not a lot of loyalty there, right? So the Athenians, for the most part, were on their own. A few cities might have sent allies, but not anything significant. Uh, they march to the coast and meet the Persians as they land. About 26 miles from the city, there's a beach called Marathon. Oh, if you know marathons, I just said 26 miles and said the name Marathon. Let that spin in your head a little bit, right? So the Persians land at Marathon. The Athenians meet them. They fight at Marathon, and the Athenians win. I want to give you the details of the battle when we get to the Greek side of it, right? But the Persians, again, underestimated the Athenians, and therefore they were defeated at the Battle of Marathon, right? By a smaller force. So Darius dies, uh, and Xerxes, his son, becomes king. And Xerxes is like, we're going to teach these Greeks, because they think they're bigger than us and better than us, and of course they're not. We took them lightly last time. We're not going to take them lightly this time. So Xerxes gets together a massive force of people, and they all invade from sea and land and try to conquer the area, all of Greece, right? And X-E-R-X-E-S, Xerxes, that's the tall, bald-headed guy from the movies, if you saw the movies. Again, not really any historical fact of that at all. Okay, so the Greek wars, at this point, we've already had the Battle of Marathon. There are three more major battles, right, that we'll talk about in more detail later. There's the Battle of Thermopylae, which is a Persian victory, and that's the Spartan 300. So again, if you're familiar with the movie, all the muscle-bound guys and leather speedos out there beating these Persians, that was the battle. And of course, as you know, it was the last stand of the 300 Spartans. Spoiler alert, right? Um, usually say that before you say things. Sorry. And so uh, that was a very famous battle for the Greeks, but it was a loss. Uh, the, the Persians moved down the coast. They eventually do find the city of Athens. Uh, it's mostly abandoned. They go into the city. They burn it to the ground. Uh, the Athenians have fled and are on an island off the, um, off the coast of Greece, or on, in, a, in a, a cove, I guess you would say, on the southern part of Greece. The Persians find out where they are. They storm over there with their ships to try to beat the Athenians. The Athenians ambush them, and they win a great naval victory. We'll talk about naval warfare when we get to the Greeks. So a great naval victory at the Battle of Salamis. Okay, so Salamis is a Greek victory. Athenian, their Spartan allies, defeat uh, the Persian navy and wipe it out, right? And so now the Persians are on their heels. They, they fought a really tough battle at Thermopylae, and even though they won, they lost a lot of men. They have a massive navy, though, and they still got their navy until Salamis. Now the navy is no more. And so Xerxes goes home and leaves uh, the army to a general. The general kind of mills around Greece for a while until he is met with an alliance of all the Greek city-states, led by the Spartans, uh, and that is Plataea. Plataea is the last battle of the war. The Persians are completely defeated by united Greece, and they limp home with their tail between their legs, right? And that ends the Persian War. Now, does this not end the Persian Empire, though? The Persian Empire is still there and still very powerful, but they will never, ever invade Greece again. Right? And they will never expand again. They are at their height, and they are just going to maintain their power until eventually a little-known conqueror named Alexander the Great comes along, and he's going to conquer them. Right? Now, he might have been in this chapter, but again, that's something we're going to cover when we get to the Greeks. Not so much in this chapter. 
Okay. Well, and all you, so all you need to know about Alexander is this. Later, Alexander of Macedon invades and conquers Persia with the Greeks, and he ends the Persian Empire. And this is a, um, a few years later after the Persian Wars, right? So not right away. But a few years later, his father, Philip, will conquer Greece. And then when Philip dies, Alexander will take all the Greeks and his Macedonians and invade Persia and conquer Persia and many other places, right? And so Persia becomes property of the, of the, of the uh, Greeks. Um, the Achaemenid Empire uh, was the Persian Empire. The Seleucid Empire is the name of the general who conquers, uh, who, who rules over Persia after it is conquered. So it's the Seleucid Empire. And later... They lose that to the Parthians, and the book talks about this as well. And the Parthians are conquered by the Sassanids. The Parthians will be the empire that mostly is there during the Roman Empire. So they will fight and trade between the Parthians and Rome, and after the Parthians decline, then the Sassanids will come to power. Okay, So that's just this list of empires that rule over Persia. I would mostly focus on, for the quiz, the meat, which is the Persian government and the Persian kings, and uh, then you know the, the, a brief narration of the Persian Wars, and then Alexander conquers them and ends the Persian Empire. Everything after that is like a copy of the Persian Empire, but it's not the real Persian Empire. Okay. So if you have any questions um, about that, about anything in the lecture, email me and come and talk to me, and I'll help answer them. Hope that clears some things up, and that's what's going to be on the quiz. Remember, no Zoroastrianism. We'll talk about that after the quiz. Okay? Bye.